All right, welcome to the Black Miss Podcast. Welcome to the Black Miss Podcast. I'm your host, Two Black. Uh, we are back for the month. Uh, I want to apologize last month. I think we were like a week late on both episodes. Some of that was because our channel on the video side um, was 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 banned. Um, <laughs> so, so we were not actually allowed to um, post. We were suspended for like 10 days or something. I don't remember. So for the video side, y'all got that part too really late. On the audio side, it was just kind of late, but still apologies for that, even though it's really not our fault. Uh so but uh but we I, we don't really know why we were banned. Like nobody on Black Power Media is quite clear. They said that we pushed some election conspiracy, but we don't really do that on BPM. So I don't really know. Nobody got to see the video. So I don't know. But you know, people hate the truth. It's right. okay. They're so, just salty. They didn't want niggas to know things. Yeah, so they, yeah. They, somebody they, flagged they, us. They, it was yeah. probably somebody that's jealous or whatever. Who knows? Um, it's interesting. There was, <laughs> there was a, there was a back and forth with a so-called white leftist channel with someone on our channel, and shortly after that, that ban happened. It was just interesting time. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway. Anyway, moving, moving on. Um, how y'all doing today? I'm drinking Great. My water. I'm minding my business. It's, it's good. Man, doing wonderfully. I'm not gonna lie. It's had a birthday, celebrated with the family, friends. I think it's good. Y'all yeah, know me. Thug up per usual. Drinking my water as well this week. He's not drinking water. <laughs> okay, I had one shot. <laughs> <laughs> but, there it is. There it is. <laughs> but I'm definitely, I'm definitely getting some. I'm getting some water in my system. Okay, I'm, I'm glad you're balancing it out. You know, <laughs> but I mean, sometimes I, 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 I get my, you know, I treat my liver right. Sometimes, sometimes, yeah, sometimes, <laughs> rarely. Uh, <laughs> today's myth is uh tough on crime. Um, we'll I'll explain that a little bit later as far as where we're going with that. But we do want to make a few announcements um just to give people some updates on where we're at here. Um, so we said this, I think I said this, yeah, this was said on last month's episode, but we keep saying this every month until we get there. So for our Chicago listeners, if there's one of you, 10 of you. However many, I know there's some of y'all because when I was at the, the socialism conference back in September, I know I met a few of y'all. So but in Chicago, we're going to be at DePaul University on, on May 4th. We're going to do a live show on May 4th at DePaul University in Chicago. Um, the myth will be <clears throat> the circulation of the black dollar because that's not a thing. So we're going to be talking about that. <laughs> Um, and you know, technically, me and Dr. Ball had our own episode on that, so it's gonna be fun to do it with my crew and get into some more information. Oh, no, I was there for that one, I remember that, yeah. So it's gonna probably go in even harder. Um, but you know, there'll be open conversations with the audience, which is something we've never done. We don't even really go live like that, so it'll be interesting to do it in person for the three people who show up or however many come. Um, <laughs> so we'll see y'all there. The uh, last time we went live, niggas was slandering me over a bag of chips. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so yeah, see y'all there. Uh, you know, we'll again, we'll keep pushing that. We'll push that on our social media and everything once the flyer drops and it, and it comes out. Um, but you know, definitely look forward to connecting with people who've been listening to us but have never seen us in person. Um, that that will definitely be an interesting time. Um, so yeah, I want to shout out our patrons. If I can pull up 
Where is the modifications? On Definitely. It? While he's pulling that up, shout out to our new patrons. We've been seeing y'all coming in every week, and we appreciate y'all very much. Thank yeah, you. definitely, definitely. Uh, For sure. So since, I think since February, last the end of February, we had um, Nikki, Nikki, Jesse Warner, Kat, um, Martin Hernandez upgraded their um, their pledge. So we want to shout shout out Martin for that. Uh, P.S. Um, I was up. What's up, Carwin Sutherland? I actually know that person. Um, Avery Johnson, Casey Bowram, and Deanna Truong, I believe is the name. So shout out to y'all. That's a pretty nice, nice list. We probably need to start actually shouting people out on Instagram or Instagram and um on Twitter. I actually think that's a good idea. Somebody write that down. Um, but yeah, shout out to y'all for that. Definitely appreciate it. Um, all of this is certainly helpful and keeps the show going. Um, one more announcement, then we're going to get into the show. Um, we have also been, me and Terrell are part of the defense committee for the Pendleton 2. For those who are long-term listeners, know what that is. For those who do not, Christopher um, Naeem Trotter and John Balagoon Cole are two political prisoners here in Indiana. Who um who were at uh, 1985 February 1st intervened to save the life of Lincoln Love who was getting beat down nearly to death by a Ku Klux Klan white supremacist guard gang by the name of Son the Sons of Light again this is at Pendleton Correctional Facility they intervened to save his life they eventually took over the prison took hostages took the prison off for about 15 hours um, no one died they received 142 in 84 years um for intervening to save his life. Lincoln Love was saved, by the way, at that time. Um, and then they spent 32 and 20 years in solitary confinement. They're still locked up to this day. So we produced a documentary called The Pendleton 2. They stood up. It's a new documentary. So <clears throat> we're going to be doing screenings on that. Um, so for our listeners, if you have a church, if you have an organization, if you have a classroom, if you have anything, um, contact us. Um, I know sometimes we need to do better responding to our emails, but we will definitely respond um, as well as the backlog that I need to respond to. Um, but contact us, um, <clears throat> you know, if you want to do a screening, um, there's no charge. If you have a budget, we do have a price system for that. But if you're just a small organization, we're not going to charge you for that because we're just trying to get the word out. So wherever you are, whether you're in Indiana, whether you're in you know on the east coast west coast whether you're in a different country if you want to screen it hit us up because we're booking screenings as we speak um i'll probably drop the trailer in on the edit um but definitely reach out to us for that and that will be dropping soon we don't have a date yet online on um breakthrough news um <clears throat> on the breakthrough news channel um so we'll be dropping there we'll probably do a collaboration with bpm breakthrough news and it'll be dropping on that channel um, probably within the next few weeks, but we haven't confirmed a date yet. So I don't want to put that out there, but you'll be able to find it on there. Um, Pendleton 2, they stood up. The trailer, I will link in the show notes. So uh, Terrell, did you want to say anything about that? Uh, no, you said everything. Um, basically, yeah, hit us up if, like you say, any church organizations, anything like that that is interested in screening, please let us know. We just really want to get the word out for it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, check that out. All right. So that's like the most announcements ever. Um <laughs> but like so today's myth again is uh tough on crime. Um essentially it goes, this is a really simple argument. I want to shout out Alec Karakatanis, who you know wrote a piece on this that kind of helped us frame our argument or the way to debunk it, essentially saying that the science shows that the best way to um, bring so-called crime down or to reduce crime is to invest in, you know, things that actually help people before a crime is committed, like healthcare and education and, you know, food and, you know, things that just help people live stable, full lives. If the science says that, which it does, that those would be the best things, ways of helping and the science does not say that prisons and police and 
punishments are the best way to bring crime down is actually proven that that doesn't really work, then you can't say you're tough on crime if you keep doing those things because it actually doesn't reduce crime, right? So it doesn't, mm-hmm. it just doesn't hold up. So then it becomes a question of what is crime and all of that. We'll get into that. So um, that's essentially the argument. It's really not that complicated. So I, I definitely want to credit him. I don't even want to act like, you know, like we we came up with this before we read that work, but it was it was an easy one to just to just give credit to him for that. So uh, we'll we'll list that in the show notes. Anyone have any thoughts on that? It's it's always just funny and fascinating when things that are so simple get made so completely twisted, mm-hmm. warped, and then it always constantly just drives the question: Then why? Like if, mm-hmm. if the answer to crime reduction is as simple as social services simple as feeding people and giving them proper housing proper education and yet in this <laughs> shitty ass society those are the very things that get cut every five seconds yet joe biden wants to have a hundred thousand more police officers then the question reigns why like what do they want then uh, crime is not the problem we exactly are- Exactly. And the fact that you're denying the facts and the scientific research and <laughs> everything that disproves that the system that you set in place is completely, um, well, not doing what you claim it's doing, um, whether or not the purpose of the system is working the way it's supposed to be, you know, we, we right. can make that argument. Right. However, that too, yeah. <laughs> how, how, however, um, the fact that you're going to deny all of that, you're really basing your policies and everything rule of law on essentially a conspiracy theory. <laughs> you're, yeah. you're reducing everything that you're reducing everything to a flat earth, like a flat earther <laughs> or or um, somebody who believes in Bigfoot. So you, you're willingly ignorant and denying the, the facts and you want to base it, your whole idea, ideology tough on crime is to increase policing and to increase um, do um draconian laws and stuff of that nature you are no better than <laughs> somebody bro, chasing bigfoot i'm sorry it is bro, what it I, is. I won't even give them give them the credit of saying that they're ignorant or that they don't know this mm-hmm. like the science is there like i'm not nah you can't tell mm-hmm. me that they know this already that's a good point so now 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 it's a good more point. like you're willfully ignoring ignorant. the truth Mm-hmm. You're like you're you're looking at the sky, seeing that it's blue, and saying, "Nah, nah, it's just not that color." Yeah, nah, that's and, not it. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, yeah, continuously demonizing nations who do prioritize this, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> like them, yeah, sanctioning yeah. them mm-hmm. left and right, mm-hmm. making it seem as if communism is the worst thing that could ever happen. Is exactly. Is, so that's even well, funny. I mean, the like, system communist is the worst thing to happen. Yep. Right. Yep. It, good point. Good point. And anybody who says the sky is not blue, we will lock them up and throw away the key. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's essentially the logic. Yeah. 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 That, is the, that is it. Like, they know the science. They know the studies. They know the, you know, the proposed solutions for this this stuff. Mm-hmm. They're willfully not trying to perform any of this, and they're constantly they, working to make sure that nobody has a clear understanding of how to fix it, yeah. or that it's harder than it seems. But right through the use of propaganda, through the use of a split party issues that are bickering against each other, when in reality they're mostly working in tandem against the people. Um, mm-hmm. And sabotage. So it, they don't want this to happen. No. And yeah. They make every, and then they make us turn into crabs in a barrel and fight against each other for the very few resources that are that, that are remaining. Yeah. And then now, even so, so utilizing social media, utilizing um, TV, utilizing all these different mechanisms to perpetuate this image of like a life that is attainable through celebrity culture through consumerism to say that like yeah you will never we will never give you these things that should be mm-hmm. fully available for you but we will make sure that you all continue to fight against one another create these class systems and continue to like ascribe to this notion that you want these huge things even at the cost of everybody else like having less versus having us all recognize that 
everyone should have these basic necessities. Yeah, they and like you said, you know, through propaganda, they make it sound so appealing, and then they make you essentially vote against your own interest. I won't say vote, but actually, you just take on the I, ideals of the system. Yeah, yeah, you you take on the the interests of yeah. the, the class that runs society like the, your own. You know, the ruling class. You're right. Yeah. yeah. And then they make it make it sound so appealing. Um, and then next thing you know, like you said, you're uh, you're taking on their ideals, and you're you know, you know you're essentially um, going against what is pro basically the, what's counterproductive for you. I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think it, it's like um, I don't know. <laughs> it for me, it's like people who are. I'm probably getting in trouble for this one, but it's like people who are committed to whooping their children or something. You know, like I just talk about <laughs> it. <laughs> it. You just, know, I love it. I'm like, call them just, out. <laughs> yeah, it just doesn't really work like you think it does, but you keep telling, you keep rationalizing that that it's way more effective than what it is, right? Like you think that that. And 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 I'm not. That's another episode to get into. I'm not trying to get deep into that discussion, but just mm. the fact that you think that's the primary thing. Or if I just beat my child, you know, they won't end up in prison. Which you know, like I I know personally, you know, very close to home that that doesn't work. So so it's just yeah. like, so it's like yeah. Even if you, even if you believe it does work, like uh, Black, you said something. Um, it was we we had a conversation a while ago and you said something and then it made me think I was like yeah I got my ass beat when I was a kid and one it taught me how to lie better two how to not get caught three there were certain things that I shouldn't do I shouldn't do like I'm probably I, I earned that ass whooping but if anything it taught me how to be better at getting away with my shit <laughs> yeah I just don't want to get caught that was, that's the biggest takeaway like yeah, and that yeah same here. <laughs> it, it, also, it also is designed to and then you're criminalized for those very things right and so yeah. as a teacher as somebody who frequently was just like this generation of children are just different and you know having to constantly check myself and like do the work to unlearn of being because there's days where I, we was just like you need your ass beat like you are wilding but also being like, that's not going to do anything. Like somebody assaulting you and hitting you isn't going to do anything. It might instead just cause you to have more internalized anger, more internalized fear. And you might just be more like compliant, but your your behavior is not going to change because that act alone made you recognize that something was better. Um, mm -hmm. And then parents are also criminalized for that. Like you will go to jail if your child came to school. And unless you have a black teacher, like myself and others who knew better and weren't about to call CPS on you, but like your kid told the wrong person, the very thing that you thought was going to help prevent crime, you are now getting arrested for. Yeah, good point. Like it, it, you're, mm -hmm. you are getting arrested. Yeah, you know. So it's like no, it, even it, it begets itself, right? Like it begets itself. Like yeah, and, I and think, your mama go to jail, yeah. and now your child left with no parent, and now they got to go through the system. And we know that statistically, kids who grow up in the foster system, almost 75% of them will have at least been arrested once. Yeah, it doesn't. That in itself just continues to protect you. And that ties also ties into bail and all the other issues that we will get to. And people think, last point, people think um, it's similarly like with tough on crime approach. It feels good at the moment. Right. When a kid is running a mouth and you just slap them, you know, in the face because they and they shut up and the problem is resolved in that moment. But the long term mm. don't really get resolved. Right. So it's the same thing. Mm. Let's send them to prison. Let's get them out of the society. Let's send them to a dead city. Let's lock them up. Let's, you know, let's get them out of here. But it it then these people come home. Right. Then then, then or then they go to prison and, and that doesn't go well because prison is a violent, terrible place. Right. So it's like. You don't really re address the problem like you just, you know, I think I think sure. uh, um, I think Angela Davis said something to the effect like prisons don't disappear the problem. They just disappear people. Right. So it's like you just move mm -hmm. them away and then, you know, you hope that and then this problem comes back to haunt you with more crime. And then you're like, well, we need to do it again. Like it, that's that's the logic of like same thing with whooping like. 
now they still acting us. Let's beat the ass. Like it, it just you know even worse. You're up them to a whole fucking island, and yeah, then I'm, they wipe and out some people the population. And like, some kids who get whooped are not rehabilitation centers, and yeah. that's just it right there. Yeah. And true, true, true. That and bringing kind of bringing the point home, you know, some kids who are whooped actually become, end up becoming angrier. Yeah, and it, it, same way with you know adults who sent off to prison, they come out and end up being a lot worse yeah, than when they, they first went better, in. Better criminals. Mm. Mm-hmm. Like they, they not, they not, they're not gonna. I, and again, some people might just like whooping. Some people. Yeah, they take that hit and they don't necessarily mm. go out and they become very obedient. But even that has terrible implications, you know, because then you might not stand up for yourself or something like that. Mm. So anyway, I don't want to make this an episode about a different myth. But I'm just saying there's an interesting parallel. It ties in. It ties in. Yeah, there's an interesting parallel between mm. and even going back to Ryan's point about it kind of being a blind religion. It still has those kind of those those that kind of mentality too, like. You just gonna beat the 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 devil out of somebody like you're gonna send them to prison and it's gonna shake them up. Or you have those programs for kids where you know the scared straight or dare and you you know show them how this is gonna be you young black boy and they and those programs those kind of so called prevention programs don't work. You know, so, so, so it's like Bro, like because what was that, what's that thing on Twitter? The they put the dare lion up there and it was like we all let him down. <laughs> the- <laughs> bro, we all let that nigga down, hey, bro. <laughs> Lord have mercy. And, and hey. Because of that program, a lot of us, you know, started. <laughs> yeah, that's that was yeah, yeah. In the era of camera phones and viral content, our socialized instinct is to react. When one of us kills each other, we react by retaliating or calling the police. When the police kill one of us, we react by filming the murder. Then we react in protest against the murders we just filmed, hoping a prosecutor will react by charging the cop we all witnessed execute one of us as we repeatedly watch on autoplay. We react in our retweets, our likes, our shares, our prayer visuals, and even our smoldering arson. Maybe the cop goes to prison, probably not, but regardless, a mother lost her child. Then the state reacts. It reacts with more billy clubs, more tear gas, more curfews, more lockdowns, more surveillance, more censorship, more helicopters, more bribery in the forms of grants and diversity, more anti-protest laws, more solitary confinement, et cetera, just more. The state exploits our reaction, our rage in response to a life it already took to further its interests. Here is how we get tough on crime, the mythology that the state needs to preserve order for the social good by reacting in the aforementioned ways. It even convinces us, like Ryan said, through various modes of propaganda and coercion, that this reaction is necessary for our own safety. The state has us constantly in a mode of reaction, rarely developing the necessary infrastructure to respond. If we were responding, tough on crime wouldn't be more police on the streets or more weapons in their arsenal. It would be the Pendleton too, where we intervene to save a man from the brutality of the KKK running the prison at Pendleton. It would be if we threw bricks at Derek Chauvin until he lifted his knee off George Floyd's neck. Or at least that would be a start. Tough on crime would be healthy families and affordable food, education, health care, socialism, communism, anti-imperialism, end of sanctions. So it would be something more than just a reaction. And it certainly wouldn't be this shit. All right, so we'll get to this, like, I guess, starting off, this is always a question. This is really kind of what inspired this myth is the question of what is crime? You know, who defines crime? Um, like, all of those things, right? But I always think it's important to start out with this conversation that the initial crime is the colonial assault, right? So you steal land, people, resources, then you call it a country, call it a state, <laughs> Right. Um, that's the initial crime. And then you create laws and call other things crimes to keep that conquest going. That's my theory, laundering, whatever, right? So that's the initial crime. So anything after that is already suspect just off the basis of that. Like, that's how you started, right? (laughs) So so we we got to like, always got to name that because we can get into a conversation of what is crime and what is a crime and how it's socially constructed and all of those things are true. But we need to be clear where we actually are sitting in the so-called country we're at, in the colony that we're in. That's how this started. 
that was the initial crime and that's the ongoing crime because that never really ended the money made from that continued so like that's where it starts so anything out for that should just be understood within that context right as opposed to um just looking at the unjust quote-unquote laws in the society who what's the basis for these laws in the first place yeah. how did any of this get established right like just thinking about that um so again we're not going to go as thoroughly into some things i do want to refer to some of our old episodes because some of the stuff some of the history that we would get into an episode like this we've already covered in prior episodes um so there's our ghost from the past episode um the myth that we need the police and then there's the crack baby episode the myth of the crack baby which i think was one of our best episodes and if you really want to get into like the history of policing within like the last say 60 70 years um we talk about counterinsurgency and how that comes out of a cold war logic and how like the idea of policing at home and even this thing of community policing um, comes out of like embedding police in communities so you can learn who the potential threats are and grow from there, right? So we do a lot, we talk, we reference the book Violence Workers, talk about Office of Public Safety, the war on crime, how the weapons started getting transferred. We deal with all that. So we're not gonna get into that because we wanna get more into more modern stuff today, but just to give a little backdrop, just so people understand, again, if you start, your crime is is stealing people, land, resources, then you have to maintain that. So then you set up laws to maintain that actual theft, that actual conquest, right? So like crimes get defined based on that. So even if someone is doing things that truly are harmful, it's also just the fact that this disrupts the society you've established. So you lock them up. So even if someone does something like murder or something that obviously is not good, it's still part of why you need to curtail some of that if you if you run the society as you're the ruling class because that destabilizes it to the point people don't want to come outside you can't sell products you can't really people can't live in a society like that so certain areas you have to curtail that and then other areas you got to keep it going because you kind of need the threat of that thing too right so you need both and right like you just need that so <clears throat> the police and prisons become counterinsurgency or really counter-revolutionary because again this doesn't just exist inside the United States. This is also a program that's international, right? Um, so this is one of the definition of counterinsurgency uh, from Christian Williams and the other side of the of coin, counterinsurgency community policing. This style of warfare is characterized by emphasis on intelligence, security, and peacekeeping operations, population control, propaganda, and efforts to gain, gain the trust of the people. So when we talk about particularly community policing, or even when the United States, because community policing comes out of a international model of counterinsurgency when the United States goes to another country and builds a military base and tries to establish relationships and intelligent networks in the country so they can track down the so-called terrorists or any of that shit. Same same kind of program gets applied here. Um, and then, uh, you know, ultimately, if you read the actual counterinsurgency manual, U.S. Army has its own manual that legitimacy is the main objective. So going back to my theory on laundering, you want to steal something and legitimize or steal something and clean it, you have to legitimize it, right? So that's that's the nature of the United States. Um, one more quote, then we'll move on from here. This is from Ross Sewell's book, Geography is a Threat. Um, he talks about when you set up cities, you have to identify populations, you have to identify threats, you have to identify violence. So it says on threats, there's this othering that goes on. So he says, once a group has been culturally identified as the other, through both media practices, policy declarations, and the outcries of the conditioned public, the deployed forces have been given clearance and discretion to do a range of actions without use of a range of tools, right? So tough on crime is also getting the public behind you, right? And and feeling, and the public needs to feel, at least a certain portion of the public needs to feel like these things are justified. Otherwise, no, it doesn't really work. Like you need a portion of the public to feel like there are these threats that we need to put away, right? And you gas people up. And that's usually done through, you know, dog whistling and racially coded language. Or sometimes you just explicitly say what you're going to do. It's not even racially coded, depending on what era we're talking about. And there's even always been... through... oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. even thinking through at a foundational level, like when we talk about the colony itself, um, even before we transition to more present practices, which we're going to do now, like looking through in the beginning, anything from um banning of languages when mm -hmm. we look at 
even within white communities with Salem witch trials, when we talk about people, if anything was identified as being against what the colonial ruling class viewed as acceptable, which was Puritan Christianity back then, then it was it wasn't only enough to make sure that folks knew that this wasn't acceptable, but they publicly, some of the first forms of propaganda publicly made sure that people knew that this was unacceptable. Yeah. Public hangings, burning on the stake, yep. Yep. burning mm -hmm. books, um, mm -hmm. and making sure that the crowds were brought in to watch this spectacle. And we see that shift now to the way that the mm -hmm. media handles things. Nobody mm -hmm. wants to get beheaded in the town square anymore, but it will be blasted all over the media. The The captions will go crazy on Instagram, on Twitter. The newspaper headlines will go run, will run wild. And so... <laughs> That th these aren't new tactics. Like, oh, that's a good connection. Have been woven yeah. in. Very good connection. Yeah. Wow. In a lot of ways, that's almost worse because you're able to get a message out a narrative so quickly through because we have so much access to so much information through our phones right now, yeah. and it's easy to get a false narrative out there and then build a following behind it, and then yeah. actually get policies pass because you built this false narrative um and even so while cam was talking i also thought about you know the boarding schools they made native made the indigenous people um uh, attend to get rid of their culture as well you know um that's part of the the system as well as part of colonialism and while black was speaking at the beginning um one thing i thought about is we know the system is working how it's supposed to because the same demographics of people are still in are still in power from the beginning of this colonial rule till now yeah it's, it's always been white christian wealthy men yeah no it's, it's it's literally what you just said or what cam just said the the medium has changed but the mm -hmm. tactic is still the same and mm -hmm. the audience just gets bigger is and when you mentioned the boarding schools, like the first thought that came to my head was uh the episode we just did with uh, about Patrice Lumumba. Mm -hmm. Like the they Ole, set, the Evole City, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they set up the schools and everything for these people to learn what they wanted them to, of course, mm -hmm. and prepare one of them to try to propel themselves to this fake echelons of hey, you're at this level in society, you need to uphold this and everything and they went for it. Mm -hmm. So it's and literally then, the same. It's, the shit is recycled. But the and then be, because of the ruling... Oh, I'm sorry, my fault. I just want to make one last point. Okay. And because of the ruling class is able to establish those values, anything that goes against it, I think, pretty sure we all said in this different way, anything that goes against it is, will be considered a crime. It will yeah. be punished as such. And to Cam's point, like the, the way that a society can be ratcheted up to, to eat itself, basically... Mm -hmm. um you know that 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 strategy is still alive even if the um way like Terrell said even the way of doing it is differently like so so um mm -hmm. it's not as brutal where we're actually watching like Cam said literally watching someone hang even though that you know there's but still, we are still <laughs> we actually them. are we're still watching yeah. them yeah. kill us yeah. at alarming rate and what's interesting though is like when thinking through like the ways that they they create this spectacle and like they create these notions of what crime is, is then on top of that, even the very people who are observing this that know this is wrong are so fearful that anybody who even tiptoes that can place their their version of security at mm -hmm. risk, people mm -hmm. then feel more inclined to turn them in. So now it's like you may have not, like you know that this system is wrong. I could watch mm -hmm. someone break into a car right now and I might to my my I myself go mind my motherfucking business, but somebody else who doesn't know who, who if that was their car and they lost the key and they broke a window because of the threat to them alone, they're gonna call the cops. They're gonna participate in the practice of othering and making sure that whoever that person is is gonna be gone because they don't want that risk to themselves, even though they don't have any clue of what's going on or why they're anyone's doing these things. Or if it's even wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we all become the, cops, right? Just but we also know that the police aren't here to protect and serve us. No, They're no. here to protect yeah. and serve Except the for interests certain, of the state. 
Like right. they're protecting the state's properties, the state's r- rules, their regulations, and they're out literally doing that. And we just so happen to somehow bought into that through propaganda, like, and through all of the ways in which they have pumped these police shows into the media. I was reading mm-hmm. something earlier that said um, over the past decade, police unions alone have donated over a hundred million dollars um, through d- different measures for to con- for cop shows. So like yeah. everybody in my didn't see Law and Order, CSI, all and, that, and that came strategically after the sixties yep. and the early seventies. If you look that yeah. up, I like read on it. Yeah, like that. They because their image was in shambles <laughs> around that time. So. Like all these reports are coming out, you're on TV beating people for one just rights, and you know, like the 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 hoods rising up on you. Like, yeah, so they wanted to rehabilitate their image, and we got this influx of cop shows. But again, all of that's counterinsurgency, and then we have the actual programs, right? So we have mm-hmm. we have about Cointel Pro, um, right? The program in Cointel Pro, because a lot of times people just throw the term out. Is this program called Get the Ghetto Informer Program? They would set up posts. <laughs> this is funny because of a past conversation we've had. They would set up posts at barbershops um, <laughs> and, and try to do, and they were they were listening posts. And and this program actually wasn't very, um, it didn't actually work as well as they thought it would. If you read the documents. <laughs> but, they, but, they would, but, but they would set up. You're going to get a lot of crazy. I mean, <laughs> you keep this in if you can leave it out. You're going to get a lot of interesting conversations at the barbershop the negroes <laughs> prefer i bet these niggas was listening to the up. i bet these niggas was listening to the recordings like that has nothing to do with what we're doing nah, <laughs> you're not gonna get much bro like, i don't know what that's <laughs> in a two-hour span they went from talking about um MLK's hairline to his political actions in Montgomery. Yeah. The, the, and then the Cointel Pro was initially, a lot of folks don't talk about this, was initially like invented to my knowledge to deal with communists. And then it, it shifted to deal more with the civil rights and black power. That's why the one of the main ways of attacking King was just calling him a communist. Like it was already part of the program, right? A slandering, like anti-communism was already part of the program. Um, and then, you know, we... You know, Terrell brought up earlier. We dealt with Patrice Lumumba and um, and in the Congo. But you know, we 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 as we so very you know detailed how how deeply the CIA had infiltrated that. That was counterinsurgency because they didn't just they didn't just assassinate it. What did they do? They they actually got they went into the community, went into the country, and got built up entire relationships with Mobutu and all these other folks. Casa Vuvu and and set up relationships so they could push Lumumba out and put up put in a puppet government. They had all this intelligence about what was going on, right? They were paying people, paying politicians, all of this shit, counterinsurgency. So like the police, the prisons, all of that stuff should not just be seen as just, you know, oh, they just don't they just can't protect us or no, nah, it's just part of like a broad. I'm not saying all of it is t- counterinsurgency and there's no other parts of prisons and police that aren't other things but the the a lot of the driving logic is that so tough on crime like we said it's just it's a logical outcome like you got to keep it going you know and you always need an insurgent (laughs) it's like when we talk about with crack babies you always need an insurgent group of people to ratchet things up right that's just the nature of tough on crime so like Stuff on crime, like to give a quick genealogy, just run through these things quickly. Certain presidents who pushed it. It goes back even further than this list we're going to name, but we're going to start here. Um, so you had um, George Wallace. Rest in piss. That you said DeSantis? No, oh, I said rest in piss. piss. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Same difference. I was wondering. I was like. Uh, he was famously known for the, you know, the, the speech. I draw the line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny, and I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. Like that's that's that guy, um, <laughs> but he was one of the first people who pushed the, this this tough on crime 
law and order, because law and order and tough on crime essentially go hand in hand. So just law and order, tough on crime logic. And initially for him, it was like he didn't even really hide it. It wasn't even really a dog whistle, really. He was just like I'm civil rights people, just outside agitated. And it really wasn't just that even black folks. That was obviously a part of it with the segregation part. But it's also they felt like there was a breakdown in certain cultural values. This is that whole conservative kind of feeling, that white Christian perspective. Um, <clears throat> so he starts saying that Lyndon B. Johnson says was on his own law and order thing. I don't know if that was actually ever something he put in his speech, but he launches the war on crime, as we talked about in the Crack Baby episode. I'm not going to go into that deeply. Then there was Nixon, you know, who oh, boy. know for the tough on crime law and order, like, you know, with the Southern strategy and all of that, um, where they were trying to capture Democrats from the South or former Democrats, you know, who were pissed mm -hmm. off about integration and, you know, civil rights. <clears throat> so he starts speaking to them. It is time for an honest look at the problem of order in the United States. Dissent is a necessary ingredient of change. But in a system of government that provides for peaceful change, there is no cause that justifies resort to violence. Let us recognize that the first civil right of every American is to be free from domestic violence. So I pledge to you, we shall have order in the United States. Um, and we you know we read the quote in the last episode, or not the last episode, in the Crack Baby episode about like how the goal was really to just like, the goal of the war on drugs was really to just lock up you know, black radicals and the white left, yep. and the world left. But there was another quote from um, uh, Halderman, Halderman um, in his diary. He was, this is what he wrote down about Nixon. He said, President Nixon emphasized that you have to face the fact that the whole problem is really the blacks. The key is to devise a system that recognizes this by not appearing to. It. You know, so yep. you, you know what kind of time they was on, like when they talk about tough on crime, law and order, this is the kind of time they was on. You know, mm -hmm. right in the war on drugs, same logic, tough on crime. You know, we, bunch of dog whistling. Yeah, we we documented this. Uh, mm -hmm. we didn't talk about it much. George Bush one senior with a Willie Horton ad. This comes up on a lot. We read about this stuff. This is like pretty well known. But the Willie Horton ad was a a a, a criminal, so called criminal, who's released from prison. And he goes out and rapes someone. So they made an ad of this black man who got released to and and went out and committed more crimes to show that democrats were weak on crime right that was the whole or soft on crime that was the whole point of the ad um in 88 i believe um and that was the battle in the 80s like we talked about was who's tougher on crime and joe biden was one of the leaders in trying to push democrats to be tougher on crime than they were you know, you know that's how we get to these mandatory minimums of crack versus cocaine you know bill clinton did the crime bill george bush was the war on terror you know, the Obama administration, there's many things we could go into there. But the one I wrote down is Obama administration openly like defended cops in court, um, you know, when they had killed someone. Um, so, you know, but they try to Obama did try to bring the rhetoric down of war on drugs, but it still was the same logic. Trump, I mean, the man, everything, was, everything. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fucking everything, bitch. all of the all above. I all need not, above. I need not go through that. We lived through it. Um, you know, and and Biden, like Cam said earlier, is talking about you know hundred thousand cops, <laughs> you know, trying to pull the same shit that Democrat, like, because because remember there was the fund the police, and it's like we we want to fund the police, you know, like so this An lot of mention of this demon Eric yeah. Adams, this oh yeah that, that that's actually, so this is deeply embedded in both parties, so anyone who wants to just put this on like you can't play that card like they've all played this game of mm -hmm. who who can block up more niggas. Right. Like everybody's played that game. Who can lock up more? Who can get who's been score more political points on locking us up and beating us up and, you know, and poor people. And that's that's just the game they've been playing. And again, mm -hmm. their base, unfortunately, that's that's right for it on both sides. You know, Democrats like to seem a little more sophisticated, like we're smart on crime or whatever. But same, you know, belief in this this kind of binary. Some examples of tough on crime policies. We do want to give people material things here. So there was a Rockefeller drug laws that get passed by um that by the governor George what was this what's that man's first name? George George Rockefeller, I believe, um, governor of New York in the early 70s. And this is when there was a pushback to what we were talking about earlier, these kind of these more um 
the like liberals were trying to do their like welfare programs, which again are poorly done. And you know, some folks in our community still believe welfare is actually what ruined the black community. That that's another myth to deal with in a different way. Um, <laughs> but like, yeah, don't, get, don't get that started here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but um, the black people aren't the highest population on welfare. Yeah. So um, so this is in reaction. This is in reaction to the night to the late the 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 rebellions and riots in the sixties and you know I um I have a quote Gerald Ford actually said how long are we going to advocate law and order in favor of a soft social theory that the man who heaves a brick through your window or tosses a firebomb into your car is simply misunderstood and an underprivileged product of a broken home. Um, and if you remember, Joe Biden actually says something similar when he's trying to pass a crime bill. The consensus is, A, we must take back the streets. It doesn't matter whether or not the person that is accosting your son or daughter or my son or daughter, my wife, your husband, my mother, your parents, it doesn't matter whether or not they were deprived as a youth. It doesn't matter or not whether or not they had no background that enabled them to have to uh, become a, a social uh, become socialized into the fabric of society it doesn't matter whether or not they're the victims of society the end result is they're about to knock my mother on the head with a lead pipe shoot my sister beat up my wife take on my sons so I don't want to ask what made them do this they must be taken off the street um. So this logic that basically this shit is soft and it doesn't work, right? Like this doesn't this doesn't deal with the problem, you know. Like we were saying with beating kids, you just need to beat these kids' ass. Like you need to like these niggas up. All this social theory, all this investments, and in, no, it's not working. We need we need to put more folks on the street, right? So that's that's so the sort of rock. Also, working. also black. It's it's uh, Nelson Rockefeller. Thank you, thank you. Not that I care about this man's name, but I couldn't. Yeah. Remember. Um, <laughs> like, well, no, just, like that's that's saying like it's actually like that's working when it's not. Mm-hmm. They're saying mm-hmm. these people are still rioting, even though we gave them civil rights, even though most of it had nothing to do with anybody in Northern City. Um, but they're saying <laughs> that these people, we gave, we gave them civil rights. We gave them, you know, hey. them black politicians. They got. You know, Sidney Poitier, whoever was alive at the time, why are they acting <laughs> like this? You know, this isn't working, right? So like, that's the that's the logic. So it's actually it's oh like, my gosh. Yeah. The, they said Rockefeller was in a meeting. They actually said he was actually one of those so called moderate Republicans. You know, we never hear people say a Rockefeller Republican, if anyone's ever heard that, that's a dying breed, but it's a Republican who believes in some kind of social safety net like maybe scaled down. So he initially believed in that. And when you look it up, they said he just flipped. And he, they, I think one of his people said he did an about face. And he was like, you know what? Lock everybody up. Mandatory prison sentences, you know, 15 years for um to life for drug dealers and addicts. This policy started, um, this policy is kind oh, of boy. where you get the mandatory minimum. Front and it kind of moved things forward. And then... You also got to push more people pushing the death penalty. The broken windows policing I always found interesting. It effectively says that if me and Terrell live in a neighborhood and we leave the window broken, then me and Terrell are going to feel defeated and we're going to think it's okay to have more broken windows and we're going to commit crime and the people in our community are going to commit crime or we're going to acquiesce to the people who do commit crime. So we need to deal with low level petty things like low level things like breaking a window or you know um stealing something small we need to prosecute those things because if we don't it's going to erupt it's this slippery slope argument that then the whole community will just become deviant because we allow deviancy to you know float throughout our community that's the broken windows theory of policing that you know we still live with today they've changed the term to you know um what's the term it's another term for a type of policing but you know you get the logic that was james q wilson and george kelling who came up with that um that comes out i think in like 82 or something of that nature and a lot of the stuff that we grew up on in the 90s and the 2000s was led by this 
this theory where, you know, we're going to lock people up for small shit, you know, people who drank on the streets or stuff like that, you know, like we're going to lock Loitering. Up. Standing yeah. around is a problem if you are black or brown. Yeah. Literally standing. Yeah. Around. I mean, Eric Garner gets killed on this, right? Like, he's out selling, what was it, cigarettes? Lucy's, yeah. Lucy's, cigarettes. Yeah. yeah, and then he gets strangled for that because, you know, he was he was just trying to make some money, and they're like, nah, we can't have that. There was even a study in <laughs> the police in New York. I don't, Cam, you weren't there yet. This is like 2014 That's when they right. when they turned their backs on um, de Blasio, and then they went on a work slowdown, but crime went down ninety five percent during that slowdown. <laughs> I remember that. So, I remember and, that. And they had to get them to go back to work because the city was losing revenue because they weren't collecting like tickets and stuff. Because they basically just were like, "We can't legally protest or we can't legally strike, so we're just gonna do a work slowdown." But it actually, shows we really didn't, you know, they really they didn't need to be there. Yeah, yeah, the city was okay with them just responding to the most basic stuff. But they all of that, like, I don't know if I need to get out of my car. I'm not going to get out. You know, everybody was fine. Like, it didn't really, you know. Like, um, oh, wow. We learned that if I don't harass people about not paying two seventy five for the fucking subway or for just standing around in front of their local corner store, if I don't stop and frisk people for no fucking reason, that people will just live a normal, somewhat happy life. Yeah. I guess we should go back to work because this is this is this is too much peace. <laughs> I need New York to be scary again. Yeah, got them. Yeah. <laughs> so. It's one of those things like hey, New York, every city in America, they thrive off of crime. And I put that in quotation marks for you know our listeners on Spotify, Apple Music, all that. Like they thrive off crime. And mm -hmm. it's literally just like it's literally just to collect that money. Yeah. And I think Alec Alec brought it up in one of the one of the interviews we watched. Um, there are people literally just in jail because they couldn't pay and stuff like that. And we'll get into that later, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But like their thrive, their their the crime is literally dropping, and that's a problem because they're not getting paid from it anymore. Yeah, no revenues coming. Like the city, the city is losing revenue. Because it's actually built a model around this, like Ferguson, for instance, built an entire model. Ferguson, Missouri, mm -hmm. you know, built an entire model off of just you know traffic tickets and all kinds of fees, and they funded the government off of that shit, right? So, and it happens. This happens in a lot of places, but like because there was such a big deal that they had to investigate, and they found that out. And I'm sure it's still happening, but you know, like that's there's other ones. Um, three strikes need not. Everyone knows that one deportations mm -hmm. you know like yep. the hard deportation laws trump was even, you know, even looking at the the ways in which they they escalate crime right so for instance you can get a um a speeding ticket traffic ticket you can get any ticket really in california most of them will run you a speeding ticket for example because i've lived through this um we started off at 248 and this is in like 08 a speeding ticket you can be going five miles over whatever the fuck they chose because if you're going 15 over they'll repo your shit and that's even more money but a speeding ticket 248 god forbid you whatever the address on your license is does not actually align with where you live and you didn't pay that ticket immediately you're not going to get the ticket in the mail so when you miss the first date to pay your ticket online which already is a problem because not everyone has access to internet or credit especially card back then. or has the fees. Yeah, nope. Especially in 2008. <laughs> nope. Yeah. Or you didn't have a ride to the courthouse or yeah. whatever it was to go pay your ticket. Your ticket doubles. Uh, no, it triples. So your $250 ticket is now $900. And if you didn't pay that double ticket before your actual court date, you now got a bench warrant. And then mm -hmm. if you... Then if you show up to go pay your bench warrant, you have to hope they'll allow you to see somebody to either pay more on top of that, which could run you anywhere from now. Now you're looking at $1,500 to pay that day, no payment plan out the door, or you're going to sit in jail. And that's if a judge even allows you to pay it on the spot. Yeah, you got and you got that debt plus bail. And so you just waiting for you just waiting for a day, you know, where you can get heard and you got to pay all that. Um, but there's a story I'll get to later about that. That's 
it's really terrible, like deeper down the notes. Um, I remember, I remember when I, I remember my the apartment, this apartment I lived at, they simply, they changed their program online for payment. I had mine on automatic. I didn't check it the day of. I come home the de- the next day. I got an eviction notice on my door. I'm like, bro, I paid my rent. So then I call the office. They're like, oh, we sent it to court. But if you pay the court fees, you can get it rescinded. I'm like, y'all fucked it up. Like, I, I paid y'all. So I had to pay like an extra 200. I don't know how much it was that month. Plus court fees. I had to get a fee from the apartment complex plus the court. for. So I almost doubled my rent that month for something that I didn't even do wrong. And they're like, the system is what it is. We Like, the, the computer system, we can't go back and fix it. So, like, yeah, court fees is a whole nother thing. Not even just the tickets you get on the outside. Like, court fees are ridiculous, and a lot of people get caught up in that, and it don't even make sense. And then everybody gets paid off of that. Um, maximum security prisons. You know, we're talking a lot about laws on the outside, but on the inside, maximum security prisons. In part two, you'll hear about, you know, the penalty to who live and went through that terrible, horrible experience. Um, but, you know, maximum security prisons where you're you're 23 hour lockdown, you ain't got no window, you got to come out on a leash, you know, they leave you in a shower. I mean, just terrible stuff, I, you know. Um, and then, um, you know, zero tolerance policies, which really I think people need to think about that, not just on as general laws, but how that applies to even school, that kind of zero tolerance policy of a suspension. Mm-hmm. You know, all the penalties the kids get. And then 2020, after the George Floyd protests, there was a backlash. And then all of a sudden, you actually saw anti protest laws. And I would even say we need to think about tough on crime, even like now, the way they're targeting trans kids and things. And that, like, all of that is a, is a logic of like, again, insurgents, like kids, you know, are, are the, are the, are the problem, or we're going to say it's their parents or whatever, right? So, like, this logic is deeply embedded. In, in this society. Um, <clears throat> so those are just some examples of like, you know, it's a, a little bit of history on tough on crime. Now we want to get on, okay, do tough on crime policies even reduce crime? Do they even work? So, but first we need to just think about like, how is crime data even tracked? Because I think we'll say crime is up, crime is down. And it's like, based on what? You know, like, what's the actual methodology for even saying crime is up and down? How do we know? So, like, there's even different methodologies on how crime is even reported. So there's, like, the cops report crime and there's victimization surveys of crime, right? And they also, they often don't align with each other. So depending on what methodology you're looking at, crime might be, quote, unquote, up or down, you know, depending on it. So with, like, with cops report crime, one, if anyone has watched The Wire, anyone that's lived in the hood, anyone that's seen it, cops cook data, you know, so they can make Ooh. crime go up, they can make it go down, they can reduce things to misdemeanors, they can push them up to felonies, they can go be felonies, they can do any, they can do all that, right? They can make they can the stats, yeah, juke in the stats, juke in the stats. <laughs> you know? so, so it's like, so, so you have to think about if crime is up or down, like based on what, because it was a study done. Um, I think it was the Newark Police Department. No, it was it was in New York, and it was an anonymous survey of nearly two thousand retired officers found that manipulation of crime reports, downgrading crimes to lesser offenses, discouraging victims from filing complaints to make statistics look better, has been a long part of the culture of New York Department, New York Police Department. This is NYPD, and this is in two thousand twelve. Um, and almost everyone in the survey said they were part. They've done it before, so it's not just one cop here and there. You know, like this is regularly happening, you know. So even with that, you always got to look at when crime is up and down. It's like well, the mayor is in office and the mayor might need crime to go up, might need it to go down. There's all kinds of stuff right that, like that. So it's like, even then you got to look at what do we even mean by crime? And then also, uh, this is something that Alec points out in his piece, like police assaults and police crimes aren't really included in, in the so-called crime rate. Of course because they're not. You know, yeah. because they rarely arrested for any of the things they do. So it doesn't get reported. But they're snorting the coke that they yeah. went to go bust. <laughs> when they're slipping the money from the stop and frisk into their pockets, when they're walking around just snatching stuff off carts and eating them, nobody's saying anything like that. 
um there's a funny clip that I watched when um even when we talk about like damage uh in the city a lot of that isn't counted in police crime data mm-hmm. I was laughing watching a clip not too long ago um about propaganda around cop movies and tv shows and they're talking about how you know when police are stopping folks and like give me your car i need to go catch a criminal like that's just not getting reported as you just stole somebody's car (laughs) 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 i was crying i was like and there was another clip that was talking about um in every superhero movies when they destroy the fucking city like (laughs) who has to deal with that but when we look at the people when we're looking at drug busts when we're looking at or Mm. um assumed drug busts when we're Mm -hmm. looking at raids so often like the damage to the to folks lives not even just psychologically but the physical damage to their homes are not considered problematic or a crime and Mm -hmm. oftentimes folks are discouraged from filing uh, most of the time they're just going to folks and be like just file it on your insurance like people aren't actually getting help to fix any of these problems and they no one sees these as even problems. though my insurance will go up <laughs> right right like well, it's just collateral go. damage to them Another test. Yeah. you know that's that, when... officer, that's that officer walker policing <laughs> you know when um cam was talking about <laughs> you know damage to property, superheroes, stuff like that. Reminds me of the boys, right? Because in the way, (laughs) they just do all kinds of damage, right? (laughs) They don't, and they don't answer for it. They don't pay for it. If anything, they try to sweep it underneath the rug. Just move on. Like it didn't happen. Just move on. Sorry, your boyfriend's dead. Sorry, your girlfriend's dead, you know. My bad. Part of propaganda (laughs) is, is showcasing the very few that might get a payout um mm-hmm. even though we know that there's no monetary amount that's going to ever bring a life back but they they want it to be believed mm-hmm. that these things happen when accidents finger quotes for those that are listening happen and a bystander gets harmed or hurt or um unfor- or murdered you know once in a blue moon you, you just because you hear so often that well the city paid them out they got paid mm-hmm. for getting beat etc etc cetera, et cetera you begin to think that, well, maybe this is just how it goes. And that's not true. They also don't talk about where that money for these, pay- well, we have on the show, if you've listened yeah, to we have, we've yeah. talked about where the money for these payouts come. No, I'm so sorry, but what does the, what does the body thing. cost? Yeah, that part. What does mm. the body cost? Like, if, 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 Lord forbid, I'm struck down because an officer was chasing somebody over a, a fucking gram of weed or some stupid shit, and they pay out my wife like what? What are they paying? What seventy five thousand, hundred thousand? What? What? What does the body if, cost? If it was on video, up? maybe we can get the price up a little bit for you. But you know, occasionally I, I, you might see mm-hmm. on video when somebody was wrongly um a, a charged with a crime, and now they've lost thirty four years plus of their life, and now they're released, and they got a minor check, but they don't they they have nothing to show for it. That felony doesn't go away. Their lives are not completely. And those thirty four years are gone. You know, that's gone. There's no, there's no amount of money that's going to do. It. And and so none of those none of those things are actually ever considered when we look at like what the data says. And if it was, then it would be really interesting to then break that down of like when we talk about crime rates, what percentage of the crimes that are being committed are by those that are agents of the state? Yeah, because it's like police also even another thing on uh, that lastly on the police, like, um, you know, sexual assaults. Like mm. they assault people when they arrest them, and then they also have like some of the worst rates even when they go home. You know, they actually have higher rates than the general population. Same thing for domestic violence. You know, but a lot of that doesn't doesn't that we get that data probably more from the what we're gonna talk about with victim victimization surveys because they're not often you know they don't report that. You know, so mm-hmm. yeah, that, these things aren't even factored in of what so called like um so-called crime is so i'm saying even when they say crime is up and down they're often pointing to certain crimes are up or down right so they're not because if all crimes are up right like the so-called crime rate which just to give people a sense of the general way it's detected is like out of out of a hundred thousand people how many people have committed a certain amount of crimes per a hundred thousand people and then they they come up with an uh, with a number from that and that's how they just detect whether it's up or down you know, based on based on a certain time period, right? 
Um, so then they'll say it's, that crime is up or down. But again, we're saying how much of this even gets reported, you know. Um, so even when you go to victimization surveys, which are still flawed, they don't think they're as bad as the police, but they're still flawed. You know, so if you live in a hotel, if you're in prison, if you live in university or you're on the street, you're not even in the sample. So you don't like if you don't live in like a typical don't, you know, single family home or an apartment, you don't even get surveyed. <laughs> and people who live, particularly folks who are in prison and, you know, on the street, you know, they experience a lot of type of stuff. Right. So that could that can go either way. That can actually break bring the crime rate up, you know, if you if you got some of that or it could bring it down, you know, depending on how you want to look at it. And then only certain types of crimes are surveyed. So like domestic violence, even what we're talking about, isn't very well surveyed in, in these kind of victimizations. Again, this is when the victims themselves report if something that they may not have been wanting to report with the police. Because that's another thing. A lot of these people don't even tell the police if something happened. You know, um, if you go back to our, you know, back the the ghost episode, the the police, um, we, ne we, we don't need the police. You know, we went through a bunch of different, race like the cops only solved like 20 percent of murders in chicago barely solved rape like the the actual like like the actual rate in which cops even solve crimes isn't that high it it's also doesn't make sense on a business level right um because anybody knows that if you have to hire a bunch more people you need to ensure that you will have the business to keep their salaries paid and so that would that even anybody with a regular job knows if you, whether you work at Burger King or you work at the White House, if there is not business and there are not money coming in for this business, the workforce will then be reduced. If nobody is coming to your store, but you have seven employees, what's the first thing that's about to happen? Hours are going down. Everyone's shit is getting cut. And what do cops want? Cops want overtime, right? Cops want overtime. Cops <laughs> want crime. Yes. Yeah. And so they the go sit on the house. Yeah, they want to. They're going them. to make sure that a yeah. hundred thousand more cops are going to be hired on top of the cops that are already in the force with the budgets that already got expanded this year for the hiring. Then what is going to? What's the ROI to ensure that this this plan of his is actually going to be effective? They're going to in. They're going to criminalize more people. They're going to make sure it's it's shown showcased even more so that way he can publicly say listen i brought all mm -hmm. these cops into into the existence now and look at look we've showed you week after week day after day on the news look at all the crime that we've reduced drugs on the table <laughs> to use a wire reference drugs on the table like again what crimes are enforced so right so it's not like all crimes get enforced equally here so like one that comes up came up in the research like wage theft right for those who don't know, and I've experienced this directly, so I know this both personally and we all have. <laughs> so, so like you know, um, basically, one we like we talk about in the Marxism episode. There's our you're already being robbed because you don't get paid for your the labor you produce anyway, mm -hmm. or the work you produce anyway. Like so, even a wage is already theft, right? Like there's just that. So wage theft is in its way an oxymoron. But even with that being said, like. Even if for the hours that you're supposed to get paid or the money you're supposed to get paid, you get $15 an hour, you work 10 hours, what is that, $150, you know, taxes, whatever, right? But then at, at jobs like that, you work 15 hours or you work the 10 hours for the 15 an hour and your check says you have $100, you know, as opposed to the 150 you were supposed to get. And you're like, where's my $50? And they're like, We'll put it on the next check. I used to happen to me, right? Like, well, you're going to go over the, you're going to be full time this week. So we're going to put it on the next check because you would get paid time and a half and overtime, you know, or we just lost your hours or you just work too many hours or whatever, right? So that's, that's wage theft. Um, so wage theft by employees is almost never investigated by police or prosecuting, yet it costs low rate, low wage workers an estimated. 50 million per year, dwarfing the cost of all police reported robberies, burglaries, larcenies, and motor vehicle thefts combined. But it's never prosecuted. So, so, so when people are like, crime is up, they're robbing, they're stealing cars. Like, this is always happening more. 
but the media will cho choose to focus on, you know, the, the car robberies or, you know, people snatching purses or whatever. You know, but this is this is always happening. The person who ran out of Walmart with the TV will make the front page, yeah. but not the fact that. But the people at Walmart dollars a year. Yeah, the people the at Walmart are probably getting screwed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I'm saying. Like, so wage theft is the thing that doesn't get talked about. We are we in the middle of a banking crisis as we're recording this episode with the Silicon Valley thing. And they're gonna bail out deposits, even though a lot of those deposits are over two hundred fifty grand, which is what the the government is supposed to guarantee up to that point because it's too big to fail. But if we go out and fail, you know, I mean, I don't need to point that hypocrisy out. I think we're all clear on that. Taxes. I need to bail a bank out, but y'all telling us that we we little people down here must pay these student loans back. Fuck out my face. Yeah, and we we cause inflation because we got a six hundred dollar check. You know, but y'all got four trillion. Don't get me started on this. Don't get me started on Joe Biden and these fucking student loans. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Like that, that's a that's a fucking crime. Right. But that's what I'm saying. That's not even just seen as a crime, but then the stuff that these folks do is whatever. Um taxes, there's a whole other I didn't write down the example, but like there's there was a report that came out pro publica a few years ago how um it tracked like the, the twenty five richest people in america and it talked about how they don't pay taxes and one of the ways they don't pay taxes is they just don't claim an income because income taxes are higher they take an asset you know they take a loan out on the asset and then they just pay the they just and then they just use that as their salary for the year to have to have liquid cash and then they write off the interest on their taxes yeah and they pay what's effectively like a you know one percent tax rate, um, you know, when someone like no, they'll know, take they'll take ass they'll take assets, stock options, mm -hmm. stuff that you know they can literally just work the system around to not have to pay taxes on it, and then you know write off write off the difference of it. Yeah, if you look but at the this, irony is, is like this stuff has been happening forever, but with an uptick in folks understanding how this works, making their little LLCs or maybe not <laughs> you have an like a real established it's business. Little. But it's like, the, it'll it'll still be us that get audited first. Yep. Like there's, we've watched for the past two years, them talk about fucking Donald Trump's complete tax fraud and people are like not that shocked by it, but we're the ones who are getting audited frequently. It's not usually the folks making above and beyond what any of us could even imagine. I wanted to show we're in New York here. Speaking of Donald Trump, this I like this map. It's called White Collar Crime Zones because you know they do that with us. <laughs> so <that'd> be, <laughs> but look at all the look at the concentration of white collar crime. And you could go around any country and find like they this is this is a dope map, but this is New York and this is not Harlem. Like this is like this is Wall Street area, I believe. Um, but like they yeah, they just and you can see like the hardest red is the most crime, you know. Um well, that's hilarious because <laughs> Times Square is right over there. What is it, Midtown East? Yo, that is <laughs> That's where, like, the Rockefeller building and the Chrysler building. Wall Street yeah. is further down. Even when you zoom out, look, red. even when you zoom out, look how bad it is. Like, <laughs> funny so. enough, that big red at the bottom is Staten Island, which yep. is the only part of New York City that ever goes red. And the median income in Staten Island is like 300000 a year combined. Look, oh, look, look, look at that, Indianapolis. Look, at, look at the East Coast. <laughs> so it's like, and you can see it's all in the cities. Like, look at Atlanta. Yeah, in the major cities. Yeah. Look at Houston. Like, it's all, I mean, I don't even want to come to L.A., but, you know, like, <laughs> it's, it's all, but this is all white-collar crime, so you can just zoom in and see it totally, like, you know. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> so, for people who are on, on, sorry if you're on audio, you can't see this, but we're looking at a map of um like for folks who've seen like when they do a map of crime zones and they'll show like the hot spots in the city right like they do that with comstat like these are the hot spots this is where crime is rampant and we need to put what do we they just say we need to deploy more resources which just means more police and 
more patrol cars. But so they took the same logic and made a map of white collar crime, like the wage theft and, you know, stock buyback or stock invest insider trading and all the different white collar things that happen. And you have this map and you have concentrations of red. And it's almost in every city we've looked at, it's like downtown. You know, yeah. that's the hardest concentration. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's crazy for us looking at where that's at. That's that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, right by the circle. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, like right by that, Monument Circle is right there. <laughs> right there. Like that's that's where it is. And then they actually have like you zoom in, top risk likelihoods, breach of contract, look over <laughs> fiduciary duties, <laughs> failure to supervise. So they have the actual crimes. Like if you look over here on the left, uh, and then, yeah, like uh, defamation, failure to supervise, like all these different crimes. Like this is a great, great project. <laughs> but like <laughs> big red Lucas. But yeah, that's just to show people like the different, just a different perspective. Um, and it's all the same crime, like churning. Uh, what's this over here? account related error charge like shit and nobody oh, I bet it is an error charge it's an error for whoever else's account got charged. by buy in trading dispute inaccurate data wow isn't it isn't it isn't it isn't our government building right over there it's Sorry. all right here that's where it's like right there like somewhere here Ooh, that's interesting <laughs> but anyway go to washington dc I could do this. All day. Oh God, I could do this all day, but at the same time I'll stop. But yeah, just to show people, like that's how ridiculous it is. Another thing people need to understand, because some folks would be like, "Well, this, you know, people still niggas do still do shit," and we no one here is saying they don't. No one here is saying people don't do bad things to other people or people don't hurt people when I say that. But crime doesn't equal harm. I still carry I still carry my gun. Uh right. <laughs> right. Like crime doesn't equal harm. So so um just like we show, you can do terrible things legally. Like you can not pay your taxes, you know, which is already stolen money anyway. You can, you know, you can you can screw over people. Like I was talking about my eviction situation, which wasn't a real eviction situation. And no one gets in troubles, but that was very harmful for me. I lost a lot of money in that situation, right? So it's like harm doesn't necessarily have to be a crime. Um, and so the things that they choose to classify as crimes and the things they choose to enforce as crimes um, are often are not even the things that you get harmed about. Like they don't, they like we said, they don't even solve murders like that. You know, mm -hmm. people got murdered. There's also that. Um, so like, we were talking about jails. Let's skip that quote. We were talking about jails. Um, of the five hundred fourteen thousand people, this is as of two thousand twenty-three. This is a new. This is a prison policy. Um, of five hundred fourteen thousand, five hundred fourteen thousand people in local jails in the U.S. today, four hundred twenty-seven have not been convicted. It's crazy. But most people in jail have not been convicted because jail is different in prison. For those who don't know, um, most of them are there because they can't afford bail. And most of them are not in there for like murder and shit either, right? So, you know, again, um, there's a story we were talking about court fees. Uh Charnell Mitchell, she was arrested. This one's bad. Yeah, yeah, she was arrested for old traffic tickets. She this is in New Orleans. Um, the city had privatized the collection because New Orleans privatized everything, um, especially at the Katrina. The city had privatized the collection of her debts to a not to a for-profit probation company which is saw a warrant for her arrest. So they sold her debts to another company. The judge demanded that Charnel pay or stay in jail. She could not pay. She would be kept in the cage until she sat out her debts of $50 a day or at 75 per day if she agreed to clean the courthouse bathrooms and the feces, blood, and the mucus from the jail walls. Like, this is yep. the type of poverty tax people deal with. At, at You said $25 a day? Fifty dollars is just a sell, and then a twenty-five additional dollars is seventy-five dollars a day if she does the cleaning. Just, yeah. and then they Sorry. they said she she had a piece of paper. Sorry, she had a piece of paper actually in her cell that tried to calculate 
that how, part. How long it would take to get out based on if she worked, you know, worked these days. Like, but also the time she's spent separated from her family, her children as well. Right. That yeah, was covered in. She's definitely yeah. have a situation with CPS probably that she has to deal with. And mm-hmm. now she's got to prove that she's making money to support these kids because, you know, she couldn't pay a couple tickets. And this yeah, is just- when I read that, I'm off, I'm off. I'll go ahead, Cam. Yeah, I was like, this is just one of many. Like when we talk about like crime and what perpetuates it, like this was a mother who was taken away from her children for traffic tickets she probably couldn't afford to pay because she was prioritizing taking care of her family over a traffic ticket not to mention how often do you lose traffic tickets I got a traffic ticket somewhere in my kitchen right now I probably need to pay and then to think of she's already sitting in jail for it her kids if she was lucky you know are with a relative but now that your parents not there for long periods of time now you got cps involved probably lost her job by now and now when you get out what do you have to go back to your rent not paid unless you had somebody staying there to help with that so now you don't have a home you don't have a job and you might not have your kids either yeah yeah when i read that that (laughs) that was a heartbreaking story i just couldn't like it just it goes to show you the system that's set in place. As we all know, as we all point out, it's um, it's fucked it's work. Up. It's it's fucked up, but it's also you just the people who get lost in the mix. They're the ones that have to deal with the, the brunt of the system. They have to. Uh, they're brutalized. They're thrown into jail. They hit with fines. It's just so uh, there's just a moral travesty when it comes to the system. It's 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 completely needs to be done away with. Yeah, that and the that and then the number of people that are lost in the mix. I think we don't um, pay attention to as much because she's not just she's not the only one that goes through this. No, like, man, there's four hundred and twenty-seven thousand. Yeah, yeah, thousands that go mm-hmm. through. They are being punished for being in poverty, and then their punishment is more poverty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, on top of probably not getting your kids, mm, you just lost a job. Job abandonment, as far as the job is concerned, probably just lost your house. Mm-hmm. That's forty five days. I mean, you're you're out of pocket for forty five days. That means you may or may not have got to pay rent. If it, it, there's there's a number of ways that this can yeah, go. If you don't have somebody looking out for you, if you don't have somebody, and again, if you have somebody looking out for you, you just wouldn't be in jail because they'd probably be able to pay your bill or something, right? So she probably clearly didn't have that kind of support, or at least not financially. You didn't have, excuse me, didn't have that kind of support. So, yeah, I mean, it was important to say that story because again, we tell we giving y'all a lot of numbers here, but like when you get to the ground floor, like this is what people are actually going through. You know what yeah. I mean? Like that, this is actual shit that niggas is living with. Um, <clears throat> skip some of the more of this stuff. So essentially, tough on crime doesn't work. I think we've kind of we've proved that. You know, to let, add a few more numbers. The data shows uh, raw numbers of police have declined over the past five years. This is as 2020, and the rate of police officers per thousand residents has been dropping for two decades. At the same time, the violent crime rate has also dropped. So even though police reduced per resident, they weren't the crime rate was not affected. So when they say we need more police, somebody explain why. Um, this is the the Department of Justice on prisons said compared with non custodial sanctions, incarcerations appears to have a no or mildly crimin, crimin, criminogenic effect on future criminal behavior. So it does not really curtail future behavior. Um, there was another study that was called the Nature Natural Experiment Study of Effects of Prisonment on Violence in Community. They measured, I think, 2003 to 2015 um, prisons in um, in Minnesota, I believe. They found these results suggest individuals with the current policy margin between prison and probation prison is an ineffective long-term intervention for violence prevention as it has on balance, no rehabilitative or deterrent effects after release. So prisons do not make people better it doesn't even stop folks from doing the things that y'all want them to stop to do you know what i mean now nah, and that's yeah. because your life is ruined for the most part it yeah. on like a, on a larger like systemic manner for folks who go to jail 
if you apply for any job after that, you have to report what, that you went to prison and, or jail um, and why. If you have a felony, you do not qualify for any government assistance. You don't qualify for student loans. You don't qualify. I mean, you yeah. you don't qualify for financial aid. Um, you cannot like do any type of state sponsored job programs that are not through like a probationary, more surveilled program. And so when all of that comes about, then like, what the fuck does that leave you with? I just mm -hmm. got out of jail after doing however long. I have no house, no money, no nothing. And I don't qualify for emergency food stamps. I don't qualify for emergency cash aid. I can't get a fucking bus pass. I don't qualify for any type of housing assistance. What the fuck do you go back to and do? Right. So, Even if you want to get a job, like I have, we we all know people who who have gotten out and have tried and yeah. can't even get basic jobs um, because of the record. Or the moment that you find out or you got the job, you're working the job, and the moment they magically did your background check or somebody let it slip or you thought that y'all were close enough to tell them the truth, then you lose your job or mm -hmm. your boss holds that over your head or now you're getting paid um less and you have to con you have to be able to to allow them to steal your wages because you don't have an option so who the fuck would do that or say you know what i'm gonna just go get it how i get it mm -hmm. exactly <laughs> is it am i the only one that feels like the craziest aspect of this is the Department of Justice already knows that incarceration has no effect on crime rates. <laughs> like when I read like, that, I was like, "Damn!" Th so this information has been known and readily available for years. <laughs> but the Department it's of Justice that was in Obama. It's their that was, studies. That was, that, was yeah. that was under Obama that 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 was concluded. So, yeah, I mean, and, it's not a, it, it, this is as much as we have all the data. This is fairly observable. Like you could watch this right with your own eyes. And just if you live anywhere near these kind of like around people who've been impacted by this, it's pretty observable. You just walk around a neighborhood that this mm. is working. If you right. talk to people in prison, you're pretty clear that like, yo, like I'm over here just holding my own self up and my family calls me. And that's the only thing that gets me through. Like, it's not this place. Like, this is just observable just on the eye test, let alone when you look at the actual mm -hmm. place. Like, this, this isn't. If food was affordable, I wouldn't be stealing it in self-checkout. Right. Yeah, this isn't klepto shit. Like you know, <laughs> like we do. Like <laughs> so. So there was a study called the. Uh, this is this is on the point of actually investing in public welfare, like schools, housing, jobs. Um, you know, those are things that most effectively reduce crime. Now there is something to be said about how you get the power to actually invest in those things. I think sometimes. Some abolitionists um, don't deal with that part of it. Um, they just say we need to invest in these things. And the people that we're talking about clearly are not interested in that. So then the question becomes, how do you actually invest in the things that work? Um, but that's a different conversation. But just to deal with the argument itself, there was a study called a 3.4 million, tr excuse me, 3.4 trillion dollar mistake. <clears throat> so over the 30 year period from 1983 to 2012, they say we, I'm going to say them, not we, but they say we as in America spent <laughs> um, 3.4 trillion more on the justice system than we would have if it had stayed the same size as it was in 1982. 1982 was when the war on drugs relaunches under Reagan. That's the significance of that year. Um, so, so it says if we took the surplus for one year, um, this is what could happen. So basically, if we just took the surplus, we took the 3.4 trillion dollars that's been wasted on the war on drugs and all these different crime, you know, strategies, tough on crime strategies. We took that money and we just did something else with it. So we just took one year of that money, just one year. It said you could create over 1 million new living wage jobs. That's 114 billion. You can increase spending by at by 25% of every K through 12 public school in the country. That's another um, 159 billion. Um, because it's two hundred six billion for the whole year, you could create pr universal pre K for all three and four year olds that would be free for low income families and affordable for middle class families. Twenty billion, you could provide every household living in poverty with an additional ten thousand per year in income or tax credits. Eighty seven billion, 
You could provide health care to 5 million uninsured persons, starting 30 billion. You could fund 1 million new social workers, psychologists, conflict mediators, mental health counselors, and drug treatment counselors to address public health and safety issues, 67 billion. And you could eliminate tuition at every public college and university in the country uh, <laughs> for 82 billion. You just took one year of the surplus, just one year. There's a, you can read the whole study, you know, on that, but just one year, right? So, you know, it just doesn't. We're all getting like, pissed. <laughs> right. Like, them are, some, them, them are some big numbers. Like, that's, oh, Jesus. And for people who would say that's utopian or whatever, like, it's actually been done in other societies. They don't spend this much money on the police and prisons. So it's not. It's not. It's actually not a utopian concept. Like the United States spends way more money, and than than anyone else really no, does. Any developed nation, at least. Um, it's a very modern. Um, it's a very very modern uh, concept. Yeah. There, like you said, there's a bunch of countries that do it, and not to get back on the prison situation, but those same countries are the ones that recognize that you know prisons actually need to be rehabilitation centers, not just labeled that way. And right. Funny enough, like. They even though they were never designed to rehabilitate, even the the mild um amount of resources that used to go into prisons to provide anything, whether that was trade degrees. I mean, I got family members who've gotten multiple degrees in jail. Um, mm. All that shit's been cut. It's like all the things that would have actually been rehabilitating in some capacity to set folks up that when they get out, they could have anything. Um, and have a, a standing, a footing to to lean on were cut. Computer programs to teach typing, to teach basic understandings of the internet, banking structures, find like how to balance a checkbook, um, tr like actual trades that aren't just designed to create goods. All of the majority of those things have been cut. Yeah, cut or or bright or vastly reduced, you know, to 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 the bone of what they used to be. Um. So yeah, I don't, I don't. I mean, there's there's other stuff here, but I think that really states. I think that makes the argument. There's, you know, other stuff we did cite. You know, um, <clears throat> there's all kinds of things you could do, like a program. There was a study, a program to subsidize construction rental housing for low income residents in high poverty areas was associated with a significant decline in robberies and aggravated assault. Hmm. You know, um, and we could go on and on, but I guess essentially the point here is like, you know you you this doesn't this doesn't really hold up now some people's solution to this varies we're pretty much presenting the fact some people will say you know you need complete <clears throat> abolition of police and prisons because it doesn't work some people will say you need to vastly reduce police and prisons um and there's a debate to be had on all these things i think it's clear where we're at but i'm just saying like you know but consensus shows that it doesn't make sense to invest you know, all this money and this shit if you really were trying to resolve the problem. But as we stated, that's not what they're trying to do. So you shouldn't be outraged like, oh my God, they could be spending all this money. This is my critique sometimes with some abolitionists where it seems like they're just arguing for, uh, you know, the case that like the United States should just be smarter or something. And it's like, well, that's not really what this is. Now other people who are abolitionists get this right. But I'm just saying some folks, I'll be like, you're a little too new to abolition to even know what you're talking about. You're just saying we should just but we should just spend money on the things that matter. It's like state doesn't want to do that. So then it becomes a question of like, what do you do to get the power <clears throat> to do those things? You know, and that's the question that, you know, that exceeds the time of this episode. <laughs> but, you know, that's the question I think people need to consider because it's like none of this makes none of this makes any sense. And a lot of people who even mean well, who talk about tough on crime, like it's not really a thing. You know, like there's no reason to say that. There's no reason to be to even frame it that way. <laughs> like, <laughs> because if you were actually being tough on crime, then the things we just said would be the things you would do. That would be your primary focus. Whether you have police and prisons, you would not be putting most of your money in that if the primary focus was to develop actual, like, you know, decent living people versus just divesting and throwing, you know, and maybe you give a little bit of money to some you know, violence interrupter program or something like that. But, you know, you know, who still deal with the cops, but I'm saying like, but you know, you're, you're not ultimately putting any 
real money in that. And there's no will in either political party in America to do so. They have no interest in it. Like, you know, you, you, you say like they run as far as they can from just the idea of defunding the police. They run as far as they can from, you know, like they don't want them to do it, you know? So, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's that. I don't know if anyone has any last thoughts on it. <clears throat> Common sense is apparently a luxury that the powers that be seem to not want to buy of all the things they because that's the one luxury that they don't have shocking um so yeah it was a good episode um well again part two was gonna look on tough look at tough on crime from a different perspective it's gonna look at the actual experience that you know the this logic leads to um you know of two prisoners two political prisoners and you get to hear them talk so That'll be part two, you know, um, when the documentary is out, check that out. Um, you know, we'll we'll probably, uh, we'll, it, by the time the next episode comes out, we should probably know when it's going to drop. Um, so we'll put that on there. But, uh, you know, thank you, everybody, for coming through. <clears throat> Peace. Uh, In closing, uh, Free to Pen in 2, fuck Jeff Bezos. Um, check us out on Spotify, Apple Music, all your streaming platforms come here on YouTube. Appreciate you guys. Peace. Okay. Fresh out the plane in a whole nother state. I'm trying to eat down a whole nother plate. See like my